Hi, everybody. Welcome to ENM 2020. We are in week 28. So, yes, we've been going for more than half a year now. Um, the topic this week is um, model comparisons. So, just to, to show you where we are, we're in the first week of two that will focus on model comparisons. And so next week, we'll have a talk on model comparisons in environmental space. And then Marlon will be back with a talk on um, novel methods for model comparisons. After that, we go into repeatability of these methods, which is actually a really important topic. Um, so we'll have a couple of neat talks on that. Um, we'll have a a week on abundances and, and predicting and measuring abundances with these models. And then we go into frontiers and then we wrap up the course. So we're, we're in the home stretch um, and we're halfway through model comparisons. So um, we have a bunch of questions as always. Um, and Mona and, and Marlon, let me know what questions you'd like to you'd like to look at. That first one, Marlon, looks like it's directed to you. Yeah, but I think we can discuss about it. Huh? I think we can discuss about it. Yeah. Uh, can these tools be useful to define preferences at the family or genus level? So this is not really a niche modeling. Um, the, the purpose of this, these tools is not for characterizing the niche, but rather for testing differences between niches of multiple entities. And so let's, let's interpret this question as, you know, can you use this to compare niches of families or genera? Yeah. I think, well, you go ahead. I think the tools can be used to compare whatever you want. Like if you mix all the points of all of the family, of the, like all, all the species from the family, you know, or all species from the genus, you can do it. Like, but it carries the limitations from characterizing niches at that level. And like niche conservatism suggests that those niches will be at least more similar among each other than uh, uh, those from a different family, but that's not always true. There are always some outlier species that have either more restricted niches or more or broader niches, or you can also have species very well adapted to very cold conditions or very warm conditions. So variability at even genus level can be very high, depending on the genus, of course. So I think the limitations uh, are those ones specifically. You know, the idea of having a single niche for a family uh, could be okay for in some cases, but in others, I don't know if it's too too many assumptions in there. I think that's a good point. Where where um, those entities or those objects that you would characterize representing the, you know, five or 50 species in a genus or in a family, um, they're going to be broader than the niche of any of the component species. And so what does it mean if you have a niche for a family that's this big but in reality, the individual species are subsets of that. And so, as Marlon said, you can certainly do it, but I think you'd have to put a lot of thought into what it means. Yep. Okay. Um, Here's an interesting one, that 2740. 
I want to understand when a species invades a new area, can we evaluate niche similarity? Do I use the environmental variables for it from its original environment? I want to understand this point. So that, that's an interesting point, especially because it's been the source of many, many um, errors in inference and errors in understanding by numerous workers in this field. Um, and you'll, you'll typically see a paper saying, you know, niche shift with species invasion. And that could, that could happen, but I don't think there's been a good demonstration of it happening. Because typically what people are doing is they're using comparisons of the realized niche or the existing niche rather than comparisons that in some sense compare the fundamental niche. Which is to say, if you don't take into account the area accessible to the species and consequently the environment that's accessible to the species, then you can very easily end up comparing two different subsets of the same fundamental niche. And the subsets are not different because the species has a different evolved fundamental niche, but rather because different portions of the same fundamental niche are observable when species have different M areas. And so um, that has been the root of, again, lots and lots of papers that purport to find and document differences in ecological niches between native areas and uh, invaded areas. But it ends up being a consequence of not controlling for M. So what it really comes down to is, yes, you can, you can use these tools to ask the question of whether niches have changed in the invasion process but you need to take very, very good care of defining accessible areas. Native ranges of species generally have expanded out to some distributional equilibrium, and so they usually are easier to define than uh, accessible areas on, on invaded ranges. Now, some invaded ranges are pretty old, and so the species has spread out until it at least encounters the first set of, of uh, constraints on its distribution. But many other invasive species are still invading. And so then your accessible area is very difficult to define and may be very close to the points that are inhabited. So I think it's just very, very crucial to, to think that if you can't define an accessible area rigorously, you're not gonna be able to do these tests rigorously. Yep. I just want to add like kind of an example to clarify. So imagine, and I, I know this example very close. There is a bird in a very dry and warm part in my country in Ecuador. And this bird has been like captured and uh, has been uh, brought to different countries because it's pretty. <laughs> and it has invaded several areas like Hawaii, Florida, Spain, and, and other like kind of more temperate regions than what you will expect from this bird. And the thing is that this species has never been exposed to those kind of environments. At least in, in some areas in Spain, you can even have some uh, snow during the winter. <laughs> and that never happens in that region, in the, re in the native region of the species. So the idea is that the species in its native area has not been exposed to 
all the potential environments that are part of its fundamental niche. So there's no way to characterize that fundamental niche for that species only using the native records. And when you compare that against those environments that it's invading and it's successfully invading, of course, you're going to have differences. But are those uh, available environments in the embedded ranges and in the native range comparable? I think that that's uh, the main question there. And that makes a big difference. And that leads me to explain other like questions as well. But if you want to add something else, Mona. Well, I was going to say that, um, well, two things. So one, this, this um, assumption that evolution happened just because the environmental conditions are different between native and invasive. And both of you discussed this, that it's, it could be a, a really, a, a M has increased. So now the species has access, access to its full fundamental niche. Um, so, if if we want to test whether evolution happened, we should we should test for some adaptation to the new environments. And I was thinking when I was, was a, when I was a postdoc um, at University of Wisconsin, I was reading uh, Carol Lee's work. So Carol Lee is a professor in uh, the University of Wisconsin, and that work I really really like that uh, her line of research. She works with freshwater, or she worked when I was, you know, this was 2009 or 10 or yes. 11, a while ago. Uh, <laughs> but so, so she, um, she has at least one study that I, I'm aware of, probably lots more, where she uh, analyzed the changes in gene expression of, of cop uh, copper pod that, that was freshwater and invaded a, uh, um, like brackish water, salt water environment in North America. So from, from Europe to uh, invaded uh, US. And she was able to show changes in the ion um, channels. So functionally, how these, uh, the native and the invaded, invaded populations were different uh, in their function and they had adapted to uh, osmoregulate in salt water from uh, from a, na a native freshwater population so to me that's that's amazing you know we actually see how how the species has adapted to its new environment we we have a mechanistic understanding of what happened and the other thing that and, but of course that is really hard to do <laughs> and for you know many species it's not it's not it's not logistically possible but the other thing that I was thinking about with, with you know, in, uh, invaded, invaded ranges is that a species might be uh, released from some biotic interaction that was, was constraining the species to a narrower, to a part of its fundamental niche. So, you know, we have competition, whatever the, the biotic interaction is, in, uh, is restricting the species in the native range. If that is, that disappears in the invaded range, then, it's still, <laughs> it's not evolution in the sense of adapt, adaptation to, to uh, different or new environmental conditions. So that's all. Yeah, um, I'm, I think I wanna do a drawing that helps me a lot with, with uh, thinking about niche differences and niche similarity. Let's imagine we have you know, a species A and a species B. And we're in some environmental space, okay? So just imagine that this is two dimensions of our environment. And you can ask, are these two niches different? And there are numerous early papers that basically show exactly this. The two used portions of environmental space are different and they concluded that there was a niche shift. Well, let's, let me see if I can change my pen. I don't see how, but 
Let's imagine that our accessible set of environments look like this. This is just for species A. Well, we don't really know if, if species A would use the environments that species B is using because it has no access to them. And so we can never observe species A under those conditions, simply because those conditions are never accessible to species A. But what if our accessible set of environments for species A looked like that? So then, we know, or we at least hypothesize, that species A has all of these environments accessible to it, which is to say, in some sense, close to its distributional area. And yet species A never uses this set of environments. And you can say exactly the same set of things about species B. So to me, the crucial element in this is, and this is, this is neglecting what Mona, Mona just mentioned about uh, biotic interactions, okay? You basically have to assume that the Eltonian noise hypothesis holds, but distinguishing real niche difference from apparent niche difference has to include hypotheses of accessibility, has to include some dimension of M, of what the species can get to from where it is now. And so that, that kind of thinking framework has always helped me quite a bit because all of the methods that you're gonna look at all the methods, the, the, the geographic space methods, the environment space methods, they all come back to this. And if there's no consideration of accessible areas and accessible environments, then it's a test for identity. And that test is not particularly useful or meaningful in establishing whether two niches have diverged. Anyhow, yeah. that's 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 a that's a good drawing. <laughs> uh, one other thing that I want to point out, um, and this is just because um, some of the or many of the early publications um, have some different perspectives on this. But a lot of these methods come down to essentially generating a null distribution. So this would be frequency, a null distribution of some similarity um, coefficient when you randomize the distribution of the points or the distribution of the, the similarity values. And so you end up with a curve that might look like this, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and I bring this up because the original publication of um, testing niche similarity, so notice that this is high values, very similar, and this is low values, uh, very dissimilar. The original publication, the 2008 Warren et al. publication, focused on this tail of this distribution. So it essentially asked, are the two species that I'm comparing surprisingly similar in their niche, given the background? And to me, that doesn't get at the biological point. To me, the, the critical 
region should be here where we're asking are my two species so different that they could not be that dissimilar by chance alone and so essentially we have these three regions and this would be you know not similar which is to say we can re reject a null hypothesis of similarity i guess there is a text thing here this <laughs> would be can't distinguish from random and this would be surprisingly similar in their niches so essentially again we generate our null distribution of similarity values and then we put on top of that um, what is the observed value and to me an observed let's look at these three observed values to me these two here are not biologically different they're saying similar and one of them is so similar given the null distribution that it surprises me but i don't know what that means biologically so to me the real key is can i reject the null hypothesis of niche similarity and say these two taxa that i'm comparing have an observed uh, similarity that is so low compared to the the null distribution that i have to reject the hypothesis the null hypothesis of niche similarity so i think if people can use those two thinking frameworks that of thinking of what m and access to the other species environments need means and thinking about what is the null hypothesis that i'm testing I think if you, you use those two thinking frameworks, I think it'll help quite a bit. <clears throat> okay, other questions? Yeah, there's one, there's one that I think is relevant here. It's 2734. Uh, okay, if I have a result from Ecospat that shows minimal or no niche overlap between native and invasive niches. What does it mean for my modeling? Should I simply say there are different niches? So I should use only data from an invasive niche for my model because the species already changed its niche. Yeah, I just, I just want to mention that uh, one value of niche overlap from this software in a specific <clears throat> doesn't mean that uh, doesn't mean anything, even if it's very low. Because the important thing about this and other software that is that are available uh, is that they show you whether that value allows you to reject the null hypothesis of overlap or not, and that's the important part. I I I personally have had values of niche overlap in ecospat of zero and still they are not statistically significant why because the environmental regions available for those two characterizations of niches were so different that there's there was no way to compare them and that's one of the cool features of this program even though the reconstruction of niches are more like a realized niche because of the, the use of kernel densities even though they use that they correct the measurements based on uh, background, based on available conditions. So that's really important to take into account. So whenever you're in, in, in thinking the ideas Tom was mentioning with the first plot, those are very relevant in this context uh, because that's precisely why, why they are useful for. 
uh, uh, yeah, that's that's my answer. I'm going to be just a little. Sorry, go ahead, Mona. Uh, I was just going to connect it back to the uh, beginning of our conversation, which was M and R is the inv invasive ra uh, population. Is it has is it stable? Has it been has it invaded the area a long time ago, and we can consider it consider it stable? If not, I think I think doing this kind of test. Uh, let's say you have an early invasion, invasion, you do this kind of test and you say, oh, the two niches are different. I'm going to use just the invasive range data. Then you might underestimate the potential distribution of the species in the invaded range. So to me, that is, that is a little dangerous. If, if you don't know, if you're not comfortable, if, if you don't have the information to, to confirm that the population is stable, then doing this kind of oh niche overlap one pop, uh, invasive population looks different i'm just gonna uh, use the invasive uh, range as the training area might give you a false sense of security that the range is you know limited in the invasive area yeah and i just want to add that there there are safer assumptions when you do that like imagine you're doing not a very perfect example in which uh, invasive records are very like stable but still you do the analysis it's safer if you resolved uh, says no rejection of niche overlap than if it says rejection of niche overlap so mm -hmm. have that in mind when you're doing this if you really need to do something to explore a list those different results have different implications and it's safer to say no they they still overlap they, yeah, i cannot reject uh this overlap or i can't i'm going to be pedantic just for a moment but i think terminology is important um so 2735 the question is can we consider niche overlap in temporal scale especially for ISDM. I'm going to assume that that means invasive species, mm. species distribution modeling. I just want to point out that species distribution modeling suggests that the object of your model, the, 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 the model that you're fitting is the distribution. And yet, when we talk about invasive species, we're explicitly talking about potential distributions. And potential distributions are defined by the geographic footprint of the fundamental ecological niche. So the object of your modeling is not the distribution. The object of your modeling is the niche. And so I think we should we should be clear about that and we should use the right terminology and it should be ENM. I know it's pedantic and I know it sounds like I'm a jerk and that's fine. No. Um, but I think if you, if you use terminology that is not explicit and that is not in line with the concepts, I think you end up making mistakes. And if there, if there should be any big message from this course, it should be that the concepts matter. Okay, we started getting it right about whether niches are different or the same only, and I repeat only, thanks to the concept of an accessible area. If you don't do that, if you don't have a hypothesis of which areas and which environments are accessible to a species, then you will conclude that two species have different niches, when in fact they do not, fundamental niches at least. So again, I don't mean to be pedantic, but I do want people to get the concepts right. 
and I, I just want to add that uh, not only fundamental niches, because in EcoSpad it's not the fundamental niche what is what is modeled or what mm -hmm. is used. Even even though you characterize very closely the environment to your occurrences, if you are aware of availability of environments for each of the, the, the entities that you're comparing, then that is what's going to give you the confidence to say whether those differences found are statistically significant and not only statistically significant, but because this has a meaning for the species distribution, it's significant itself. Like that, that's one of the cool things about that, that test because it's, it's using what is available for each, each species or each niche. So that's very important. Okay, somebody highlighted this, but this one's for you, Marlon. What recommendations can you give us to select a way to characterize niches using ellipse NM? Ellipse <laughs> NM. Yeah. Uh, I highlighted, but then I, I regret it because probably that's something <laughs> that I have to talk about uh, this week or next week. Okay, so just put it off if you want, and that way you can use slides and everything. Yeah, so yeah. You say I can show something. I can show something that can you give that can give you a better idea about that. Uh, but I can do it next week as well. <laughs> it, it'll be in your talk. Yeah, yeah, that's true. In fact, you're supposed to give me that today, right? Right. <laughs> uh, question about the figure on the EcoSpat slide showing the different kinds of niches. How can we identify different potential niches? Yeah, that's that's for me as well. So this figure in EcoSpat, I show a figure that is not from the paper of EcoSpat, but it's from the same group of authors, most of them at least. And it's in a review in trends in ecology and evolution. And they show kind of lessons that they have learned from comparing niches. And it's cool because in the figure you can see a convex, simple uh, assumption of fundamental niche. And then inside that complex, simple, uh, form of fundamental niche, you have available environments, which in this case, they use all the world. That, that I didn't like, but they have different environments, but they have inside that uh, invadable, potentially invadable environments, which are not accessible for the species because the species is only in an area and they do those differentiations. And, um, and also they have what's they show what is available and what's not available because inside that sh convex shape of fundamental niche, you can have a space that is empty regarding points in what's right now in the earth. Like certain combinations of temperature and precipitations just do not exist. Uh, and so that figure is good for giving you an idea of, of what can you expect when you're doing comparisons of niches. And I think the question mainly is, how can I do that? How can I produce something like that? Well, you can do it if you have a clear hypothesis of M, of uh, a, like reachable areas or uh, accessible areas. And you have your points and you have uh, certain uh, areas that you are interested in where you have embedded records or you don't have embedded invasive records but you have like the suspicious that they can go there or something like that and if you just crop those areas and those environments and bring them differently to that figure you can produce something like that and of course the 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 ellipsoid can be produced also based on the centroid of your records in environmental space and the covariance matrix. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the answer basically for the question. Okay, I had another, another question that's I think worth looking at. Um, it's, could it be possible to have differences between niches in environmental space but not in geographic space or vice versa? So this is a really good question, especially given that we have tools that are based in geographic space and we have other tools. 
to ask the same questions that are based in environmental space. And I'm going to refer you back to probably the first or second talk in the whole course six months ago. But essentially what I want you to remember is this strange and indirect and uh, nonlinear relationship between geographic and environmental spaces. So you can very easily have a huge area of geographic space that maps onto a tiny portion of environmental space. You can have a small area of geographic space that maps onto a huge area of environmental space. And you can have the same relationships in environmental space where a small part of environmental space turns into big expanses of geography or a large part of environmental space may be very small in its geographic representation or may not even exist. And so you have to think that, that an area in one of these two spaces or the, 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 the area manifested by a particular thing like a niche in these two spaces does not have a direct relationship. It can be a very nonlinear relationship. It can be a non-relationship. And so in that sense, very easily, you can get differences between these two perspectives on niche differentiation. And so that, that's a really important point to highlight where you, you could imagine a big difference in the environmental space manifestation of two niches that geographically only makes the tiniest of differences or vice versa. So most recent uh, assessments do both geographic and environmental space assessments. But I think probably the best thing to do is to think about which matters. Now, if your study is focused on niche in terms of geographic potential, then maybe differences in environmental space that don't translate into geographic space differences, maybe those aren't very important. Maybe you could build an argument that environmental space is primordial because that's where niches are defined. And many of us think that geographic distributions are essentially secondary constructs of niches and dispersal constraints and perhaps biotic interactions. So I think you could argue that the most appropriate comparisons are in environmental space. But I think you should think about it as regards your particular study and the particular questions that you're trying to answer. But that's a yeah. really interesting question, at least. It is. Let, let me just illustrate what you just said with a GIF. Because this is also part of another question. The I'm going to point out that Marlon made this GIF. And Jorge Soberon stole it <laughs> within about two minutes. <laughs> Sorry, Marlon, go ahead. I just to show you how big blocks in geography can be so tiny in environmental space. Look that one, that one. <laughs> and then look that. It's, in, it's mm -hmm. even incomplete. The ones that are close to, for example, the coast or in the tropics compared to the ones that are in very continental and temperate regions are so big. And look at that, look those, and look that. So those, that, that relationship, the Hutchinson and duality <laughs> uh, that Jorge talked about in the, in the presentation, uh, it's important to consider when you are dealing with these kind of questions. Environmental space is not necessarily represented the same way than geographic space. And it's important. How small to, these uh, northern ones are. 
But even some some tropical regions, for example, that are big deserts or something like that, they are also small compared to other regions. And if you make this block in geographic space even smaller, I think you can you can see even more of this uh, relationship. Look at Hawaii, how big but scarce is the region. Like it's all this the Hawaiian islands. So essentially what it comes down to is this GIF visualizes environmental heterogeneity within rectangular blocks across the Americas. And what you're seeing is that some regions have massive environmental heterogeneity and some regions really have pretty low levels of heterogeneity. If you go the other way, like if you were to do uniform sized blocks in environmental space, do you have that as well? There you go. So now what you're going to see is the geographic footprint of different environmental regimes. And this is really cool because it gets at whether a species is a uh, Hutchinsonian species and inhabits the whole footprint of its ecological niche, or whether a species is a classic BAM species and inhabits only a subset, which might be defined by um, dispersal limitations. Look at all of these ones that have North America, South America disjunctions or that are North America, Andes, South America. Those yeah. are temperate conditions. And the whole point is probably no species is endemic to that whole three-part footprint, but probably lots of species are endemic to one chunk of that. And so this is, I mean, the, the Hutchinsonian duality is a fascinating, entity or, or, or phenomenon in, in macroecology. Because you can go from one space to the other and from the other back to the first space and get a different answer. Yeah, it's really interesting. And it, it's so interesting that you can stop doing your dissertation and, <laughs> and start playing with this thing. <laughs> it's so interesting that when Marlon produced those gifts, Jorge disappeared for two days and then sent us a sketch of a manuscript that was something like on the Hutchinsonian duality. He never finished it, but he was so fascinated by that pair of gifts that he took immediately two days and wrote this kind of, you know, this essay on what it means. Yeah, it's going to be fine. <laughs> uh, there, there were, let's continue with the questions. So, <laughs> because there were, there were, there were repeated questions about like, if you're in an environmental space and you're comparing two entities, but you know that sometimes to produce models, you you end up with different variables for distinct mm -hmm. entities as well. What's the implication of using can, the first? Can you use different variables to characterize uh, different uh, niches and environmental space? And unfortunately, the answer is no. You cannot. You can have an ellipse, so you can have a, a, a shape reconstructing the niches with different variables. But if you want to compare them, you have to do it in the relevant uh, access in environmental space, because it's not an, an only projection to a single layer like in geography, you have to have the same variables. And the interesting thing will be doing something like the variables that coincide between the two entities or explore first the set that the other species uses and then the set of the that the other species uses. It's not that hard to start imagining how to do it it has implications and then you therefore you have to think about them though um but that 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 was an interesting question to to me and and i have faced it and, uh, but yeah you can do it 
sometimes like that's that's probably why ecospad is done on two pc axis uh principal component access because they summarize most of the variants of a set of environmental variables and then you can do it for the two species but still like it, it applies the same principle <laughs> so yeah probably a pca could be something that you can use just to have the same access for the two entities in more in even in more dimensions Okay, any last thoughts? We're up at the end of our hour. Okay. Well, Mona, I'm glad your your LIDAR flights got canceled this morning by rain. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Arlen, thanks for joining us and thanks for the talks. And we'll see everybody next week with more on model comparisons. <laughs>